welcome to Kate's Corner, and today we're going to talk about the digestive system. We're going to look at the convoluted path of how food starts in our mouth and then goes into digestion. We use these for uh, energy and then get rid of the waste that we don't need. So let's start, and the first place digestion starts in is actually in the mouth. When you look at the mouth, we have our little anatomical figure here. We have a cavity, our nice oral cavity, filled with teeth. These teeth are good for chewing, tearing, gnashing, getting that food into much smaller pieces. And as we start to chew, salivary glands are stimulated. And these salivary glands begin to produce mucus and water and enzymes, in particular amylase, which is an enzyme that begins to break down starches. So we chew and chew and we have this great muscle of the tongue that will work that food around into a nice round ball called the bolus. And it's just the right size to fit down the back of our throat, down our esophagus. So as we look into the mouth, and if you've ever looked in the mirror, stick out your tongue and go, ah, uh, you'll see a little piece of tissue hanging in the back of your throat. My kids usually call it the punching bag. But this little uvula, when you swallow, is forced up and it will close the connection area to the nasal cavities. So that way you're not putting milk out your nose or spaghetti out your nose or something like that. As you swallow, there's another little projection called the epiglottis. And this epiglottis will now close onto what we call the larynx or the voice box. And this is our trachea. This is the tube that goes down to our lungs for breathing. This is the respiratory system and we're not gonna go any further than that either. So down in the back of your throat, we have this now the food tube, the esophagus. So let's take a little better model and take a look at our esophagus. And here's the trachea. This is our wind tube or our air pipe. And behind it is the esophagus. The esophagus is our food tube. It's a nice circular muscle that stretches when we swallow, activates muscle action at that time called peristalsis. And the peristalsis is like your esophagus doing the giant wave all the way down to your stomach. And it moves the food down to your stomach. So basically all the esophagus is is truly a food tube from the mouth to the stomach. So here we are down here at the stomach. Here's our food tube, the esophagus, joining the stomach here. And we have this narrowing area here. And this is called the cardiac valve. And the cardiac valve, partly because it's close to the heart, but also the shape and name of the stomach. And as you notice, our stomach is kind of uh, C-shaped. This large area here is called the fundus. And Inside the stomach, we have specialized cells that are going to produce um, some acid and some mucus. But on the outside of the stomach, we have lots of involuntary muscles. And these involuntary muscles, when stimulated, when you eat food, will begin to churn and squeeze. So the food now that we have in our stomach is getting dissolved and broken up even more. So let's take a look inside the stomach. If you look inside the stomach, we have all these nice folds inside the stomach. And these little folds are called rugae. And the rugae allows for the stomach to distend or expand. When we don't have food in our stomach, we have about 50 mLs of fluid in our stomach. But if you eat a lot of food, our stomachs can actually extend out to four quarts or a gallon quite a stretch. And then when we finish digesting food, our stomachs will go back to its normal shape. So here's our nice stomach here. Some of the things that you may be interested in is that this cardiac valve here, um, which is also called esophageal valve, is a valve here that is important to where people have acid reflux. If you have acid reflux, what happens is that the food that's now inside your stomach, it's mixed with hydrochloric acid, so now it has a pH of two, will somehow get pushed backwards up through this valve. And when it does that, it 
it goes up into the esophagus, which doesn't have any mucus, nothing to protect it from the acids that are formed. So if you have this back pressure and we have back food coming into the esophagus, you can get something called a hiatal hernia. You may have also noticed that if you're sick and you throw up, you really have that terrible burning sensation in your esophagus. <clears throat> and that's because of all the acid that's coming out of your stomach, so it's not a good thing to feel. When the food is squished up a lot more, it now becomes something called chyme. And chyme will now move to the bottom of the stomach area to the pyloric valve. And the pyloric valve is now going to join the stomach to the small intestine. So the pyloric valve is very good. It only allows about three ml of fluid at a time to move into the small intestine. And the reason is, is that as food leaves the stomach, it still has a very low pH. It's still a pH of two. So we have two organs that are really going to help out. And these are on the bottom of the liver, the gallbladder. And behind the stomach, we have this little organ here called the me move this out of the way. This organ right here, which is called the pancreas. And the pancreas and the gallbladder will give off various chemicals that will neutralize the hydrochloric acid and allow the, the amount of um, food that's moving in, which is now in the form of chyme, into the small intestine. So now it's neutralized. And then the gallbladder and the pancreas will also do another thing it will give off some additional enzymes that will also contribute to digestion again. Amylase for starch, protease for proteins, and lipases for fats. So the first part of our small intestines will actually break down, continue breaking down in food. That first region of the small intestine is called the duodenum. The duodenum is only about 10 inches long, and it will start the finish up the digestive products. As we move along, we'll now move into the jejunum and the ileum. And interestingly enough, if you notice, there's a lot of convolutions here in the small intestine. These convolutions allow for a small area to hold all of our small intestines and totaling about three times your height. So there's that's a lot of intestine going through. So what happens is that we have a lot of absorption of nutrients. And then as the materials that move through the small intestines are taken into the body, there's a lot of residual. There's a lot of leftovers. So what happens to the leftovers? What happens to the stuff that we don't use? Well, what happens is that now we move into the large intestine. And at the large intestine, we're going to have the ileocecal valve which is going to allow now from the small intestine um, the leftover materials to go into the large intestine. We may recognize this. We have the cecum here and this little finger-like projection called the appendix. And the appendix is very important because um, for us, if we happen to get it infected, we may have, end up having to have surgery to have the appendix removed. So the leftovers begin to travel through there. A little bit of digestion goes on. We have wonderful bacteria in our large intestines that are going to help break down whatever materials are left over, um, absorb vitamins and such. And for the bulk of that also, it's now going to absorb water. So we have our remaining materials traveling up the ascending colon. And if you notice, it's on the right side of your body. So if you ever have some really severe pain down there, you may want to look, go to a doctor and see if you might have appendicitis. We have the transverse colon that's going to go across the top of your abdominal system, and you can actually feel it. It's just under your diaphragm, and you can actually at times feel food traveling around in gas. And then you have your descending colon that is pretty much on the upper front of your body, but then it will move into the back of the pelvic area. We have what we now have, the sigmoid colon. It will move down into the rectum and the anus. So let's take this guy out here. And 
And as you look at this, here is the large intestine, the sigmoid colon, the anus, and the rectum. There's lots of blood vessels. Kind of see how this is from the back of the body. And then from there into the anus, then we will excrete or um, defecate any of our feces that we're not going to use and that'll be put out into the uh, environment. Um, the importance of the large intestine is for water absorption and if I haven't mentioned already, we have some really nice bacteria in here. These enteric bacteria help us finish breaking down those materials that we don't need. It helps us reabsorb water. And in our bodies, in our large intestines, we have anywhere from two to four pounds, think of this about the weight of a brick, um, in our bodies that are helping us with digestion. Also keep in mind that if you're sick and you take an antibiotic, sometimes those antibiotics are going to affect our good bacteria as well as the bad bacteria. And that may cause things like diarrhea. And until you can rebuild up the bacterial population in your body, you're not gonna feel very well. All right, so that's the end of today's lecture on the physiology of the, of the digestive system. And come back and see us again, and we'll talk about some more systems.